Well, you want to know how to tell a really good lie? I know that's not what you expect to hear from a sermon. But here's what you do. You start with a premise that's true. You start with a premise that's true. You don't try to just make something up that's blatantly false. You don't start there. You start with a premise that's true, and then you twist it. Then you pervert it. Then you confuse it. Then you start to fill it with all kinds of other things until it sounds like an appealing promise. So until it starts to sound like, a, like an offer you want, a promise that is still false, but one where it becomes so good that someone can't help but at least want to believe in it. That's how you tell a good lie. Or so I'm told. <laughs> right. uh, uh, you know, for the last couple of weeks, uh, we, we've seen a, how a lie like that plays out again and again. And this morning, as we conclude our series, Deception, we're going to take a look at one more seductive lie that we often believe. And it's a lie surrounding what you might call uh, the good life. The good life. The, the good life is, is that sense of satisfaction that all in your world is as it should be, right? Uh, that uh, you, you are who you're with, that, they, that they're wonderful, and they, they, that that's how it should be. And, and what you're doing, that, that that's all working out, it's, it's going well. And, and where you're at, and the beauty that's around you, that it's all good. The good life is what uh, vacations promise, uh, it's what we imagine or start imagining when we think of winning the lottery or retiring or something like that. It, the good life is what's paraded on magazine covers and ads that resonate with our hearts. Mine usually looks like a, a, a rustic cabin someplace with a pickup truck and a dog, right? You know, it's the good life. What speaks to you there? It's that desire for the good life that's an example of the longing in our hearts for a future where we experience deep satisfaction, where it's all good. It's as it should be, right? And, and there's a frequent deception in our world that steps in to promise that desire. It's as if it leans forward and it whispers to us, I'll show you how to get that. You can have that, and I can show you the way. In one version of that deception, it begins with a premise that's true. And that premise uh, is that we are all consumers. You and I are consumers. That, that you need to consume to stay alive, to stay healthy, to enhance life. Uh, and that you were made to enjoy consuming. That you and I, were, we were literally made with thousands of taste buds in a world with thousands of kinds of, various kinds of flowers, with, with daily sunsets that dazzle and, and sunrises that takes our, take our breath away. Where there's real enjoyment and satisfaction from experiencing these kinds of things in others. But, but in a broken and sinful world, the truth and goodness of consumption experiences the perversion of deception. And it becomes leveraged as a way to offer the good life by just getting enough. If you can just get enough. Steve Wilkins and Mark Sanford in their book, Hidden Worldviews, comment on this writing. While scripture and everyday experience make it clear that we must consume things as a means to preserving and enhancing our lives, 
There's always the danger that responsible consumption will degenerate into consumerism. And this lived worldview is also sometimes referred to as materialism. Consumerism is a worldview that starts with something that's a relative good, consumption. It makes it an absolute good. Consumerism absolutizes consumption by believing that we can find fulfillment by accumulating wealth and everything that comes from it. In a broken and sinful world, there's a deceptive element to wealth. See, the lie that our enemy tells us over and over and over again is that having enough makes you good enough. Having enough makes you good enough. This is the lie that's whispered to our hearts with the promise of the good life. It says, if, if you want that kind of satisfaction that you've been craving, you just need to have enough fill in the blank. You just need to have enough time off. You just need to have enough respect. You need to just have enough money, right? You just need to get enough. You just need to get enough what? Clothes? Beauty? Experiences? Uh, stamps on your passport, right? What is it? You just need to get enough of. If you do, then you'll be good enough. You'll be satisfied. You'll experience that good life that you've been wanting. Wealth promises hope for the good life, for securing it, and for the respect from others that having it will bring. But ultimately, it's the deception that having enough makes you good enough. Now, this is a lie that we live more than we think, and we live this way more than we think this way. Yet, as we attempt this over and over again, we discover that just the opposite has happened. It turns out that we never have enough. We never have enough. It's always just a little bit more, as Rockefeller said. The, the good life is just as, as elusive as ever, uh, and that wealth in all of its forms isn't as valuable or as enjoyable as we thought it would be. The new car smell, it eventually wears off. Right? And what we find out is that the more we have, the more we have to lose. And yet no amount of insurance seems to offer the kind of certainty that we're looking for. And so how do we handle this deception, these temptations as a Christian? After all, you know, if you're in here and you're not a Christian this morning, this deception probably still sounds fairly familiar. <laughs> But Christians can and do just as easily fall for this lie, don't we? Well, in the Bible, the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 6, he offers us some instructions on a much different direction to the good life. And I want you to take a look at it with me. So turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6. In this letter, Paul has been uh, giving instructions to the leadership of the church, to Timothy, a pastor he's discipled. And in those, he's been addressing specific pieces of instructions to all kinds of various groups in the church, as charges and addresses that they're supposed to go to this group and to that group. And here he's calling them, through these, to godliness, so that the Christians there will live out the gospel that they have believed in. And specifically here in chapter 6, in verse se starting in verse 17, uh, we have him giving instructions to a group that is particularly susceptible to this deception. Let's see what he has to say. Verse 17 we read, As for the rich in this present age, charge them or command them not to be haughty, that is arrogant, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. And then he shows us how this works out in practice. Verse 18. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. Thus, storing up treasure, that's a more intense form of the word for riches, treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. 
Not as a cheap substitute, but the genuine life. Now, as we consider this text, we need to start by answering one essential question so we can move forward. And that question is this. Am I rich? Am I rich? Let's be clear. Anyone can fall for the deception surrounding the good life and wealth. Anyone. Earlier in this chapter, right, in verses 6 through 10, Paul, he warned against this desire for gaining wealth and and the love of money. And and specifically, what he warned against was the deceptive idea of using Christian behavior and morals as a means to gaining wealth. Right? It's that old uh, lie that if I'm good enough, then I should have enough. If I play by the rules, then I should have enough. But Paul is abundantly clear that godliness is not to be used as a means for gaining wealth. As we look at this further, Paul is making that clear, and here, though, he's moving it forward. Instead, here he's, he's addressing someone who's already wealthy. I want you to know something. He doesn't connect those two dots, that having wealth doesn't mean that you have a love of money. That's not the case. Some in our world need to be reminded of that. And he doesn't view it, by the way, having wealth as a positive or negative. He doesn't see it that way. Instead, he treats it as a simple fact of the individual. Just like someone who's in authority or someone who's married or someone who's young or someone who's poor. It's not positive or negative. It's a fact of the individual. Rather, in these verses, he's addressing, though, a somewhat different temptation, temptations here that are attached to, not attached to wanting more wealth, but from simply having wealth. He's addressing this deception, I think, then from an angle that's a little bit different than I think we typically consider this. And it should cause us to question and consider whether or not I am rich, whether or not I am wealthy. Not metaphorically, like I'm rich in relationships or something like that, right? Or someday I'll be rich. No, rich, as he says, uh, as in material wealth in this present age, as in right now. And I think it's here that we actually have often erred. We've often erred. I think some of us have just assumed that we are not wealthy, which isn't surprising. After all, in our country, even the wealthy of the wealthy are reluctant to admit that they're rich. I've listened to Elon Musk hem and haw about how wealthy he is or he isn't. And most of us, we don't want to talk about how much we make either, right? We don't want to talk about our salary. Most of us plan on taking that to our grave like a state secret. We're reluctant to think of ourselves as rich, and we will hide behind all kinds of other comparisons to fend off that idea. But when we consider what biblical poverty looked like, or we consider what poverty looks like in many other contexts, we should recognize how we are among the 1% of the wealthiest people who have ever walked the face of the earth. Don't believe me? I got two words. Indoor plumbing. (laughs) You want to know the two words? How about uh, air conditioning? (laughs) Uh, What about uh, words like light switch, clean water, uh, ice cream? I don't know if that's two words, but, uh, but you get the point. You and I may be much more materially wealthy than what we think. So perhaps for us instead, a simple way for us to determine whether or not we are rich is to instead ask the question, do I have wealth beyond my basic needs like food, clothing, shelter, and the like? Perhaps that's the better question to ask. And if so, join me in taking this passage to heart. (laughs) And of course, whether that's true or not for you, all of us need to keep leaning into a biblical understanding of wealth. Now, if we're straightening out our concept of of being wealthy, then, then let's move forward to seeing how this charge deals with each part of our deception by considering a truth to embrace, a practice to follow, 
and a result to expect, a truth to embrace, a practice to follow, and a result to expect. Let's look at the first one here, a truth to embrace. Look back with me at verse 17. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Listen, if this deception is whispering to us that you can have the good life if you just have enough, then Paul is shouting, (laughs) no, you can't. (laughs) No, you can't. (laughs) Wealth offers the temptations of being prideful that you can do this. And it attempts to offer hope that you can go on having the good life. But Paul points out that actually you are building your image, your status, your hope, and your version on the, of the good life on what turns out to be a very shaky foundation called wealth. And we know it. You don't need the last week of the, uh, watching the stock market do what it does to know that wealth is a shaky foundation. As one author points out, one of the best examples of our preoccupation here is with insurance. Many tangible goods you possess can be insured, whether it's your life, your home, your car, or your pedigree schnauzer's teeth. Some of you are getting ideas. Some of this is a matter of prudence and responsibility. But if you take a quick stock of how much money goes towards the pursuit of security, you will also discover how fearful and insecure we are about losing our things. Fear of losing our stuff in turn reveals how much value we attach to it. Consumerism seeks to convince us that the answer to insecurity is a matter of purchasing the right types of protection against potential threats. If our identities are wrapped up in what we own, don't miss this, losing our possessions means we lose something of ourselves. Let me ask you, friend, have you bought into this deception? Maybe not wholesale, but have you bought into it? Have you quietly listened to the whisper and looked for more and more of your status from what you have? Have you put more and more of your security based on what you own? Have you put more and more of your hope on the pleasures that your wealth can bring you now or in retirement? And friends, Don't assume that just because you haven't been able to find much security and wealth, or that just because you have been thwarted in your attempts to achieve enough wealth to secure a certain level of status from it, that somehow you're not trafficking in these waters too, or that you are living out the charge in this passage. Because our misplaced confidence still needs a new foundation. For that, Paul points us back to God as the source to derive our status from and from God to find our hope for a good life. As C.S. Lewis uh, once wrote, he who has God in everything else has no more than he who has God only. I wonder if that's something we believe, though. See, the truth that we need to embrace to confront this lie is that having Christ is good enough. Having Christ is more than enough. Having enough wealth will never bring you one step closer to being good enough. Listen, it will never be good enough, and your version of the good life will never offer you the satisfaction that you hope it will until having Christ alone is good enough. And it's from that vantage point that Paul then can inform our premise of consumption. That instead, God is placed here as the source of our provision. That's an important difference. And as such, his provision, great or small, can be enjoyed. The wealth that God has given you can be enjoyed. Not worshipped, not shunned, not envied but enjoyed. But enjoying God's provision is only the beginning to a truly good life. Paul keeps opening the door with a practice to follow. Look back at verse 18 with me. We see here four pieces. Uh, Verse 18, 
They, the rich, are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. Now, pause there. Think, think about what Paul is calling for here in contrast to what the deception calls for. The lie of having enough makes you good enough perverts and places the focus on what? On what you have, right? On what you have. Finding your status and your hope in what you own ultimately stymies real service or sacrificial sharing. The church, many of us, reveal how we have fallen for this lie when we consider sharing serving, giving, and immediately find ourselves being let off the hook by comparing ourselves to someone else who has more. That we don't need to serve, we don't need to give, we don't need to do that, because that person over there, well, they have more time, they have more ability, they have more money, and so forth. Listen, that's not taking responsibility for stewarding what God has provided you with, but rather avoiding our responsibility altogether and feeding our deception through comparison. But look at the verse. As Paul is straightening things out here, where does he place the focus? It's on what we share, not someone else. What we share See, when having Christ is enough for you, you see having more than enough as an opportunity to share. Having more as an opportunity to share. You see your wealth as his provision to enjoy, yes, and to share, yes. And for the wealthy Christian, then, the liability that wealth posed a temptation through can now offer a strength. Friends, wealth is God's provision of an opportunity to do more good. If he's given that responsibility to us, then let us uh, consider some examples based on Paul's list here. Let's consider what it might look like in practice or some pitfalls. First, let's think about doing good to others. Here, we shouldn't be tempted by the idea that we can uh, give our way out of practical service or mercy ministries. That we can't just write a check and never roll up our sleeves and get our hands dirty, as it were, in doing good. No, both are required. Also, think about being rich in good works here, developing lots of good ministry. The more material wealth that we have should actually afford us more opportunities not less, to invest our time, talent, and treasure for eternal purposes. And that can happen through supporting maybe multiple ministries or being involved in civil service or life in general in your neighborhood or, yes, maybe at work too or someplace else. But we have to, in those opportunities, be sure to arrange our priorities accordingly so that we aren't wasting our time, talent, or resources in them. Third, uh, generosity in general, Distribu distributing generously with the wealth we have. Listen, here we should not be tricked into some of the cultural fads that we experience where people are trying to be generous with other people's wealth. You, you ever hear an idea tossed around about that, right? We shouldn't be trying to be generous with somebody else's wealth, or we also shouldn't be trying to uh, be generous with wealth that God hasn't given us or using our generosity as a showpiece, or allowing fear of doing all those things and more to stymie us into being stingy altogether. Rather, a Christian who's pursuing being generous uh, should think in terms of percents, not amounts. They should study how to be generous in more and more effective ways. And they need to become aware of their motivations and being able to spot the difference between Christ's grace motivating us and the world's guilt. There's many versions of false guilt that the world holds up as motivations that we need to reject if we're to live out the charge in front of us. Fourth, daily readiness to share something, being ready to share. Although many Christians have wealth, they are consistently living above their means, taking on burdens of debt unwisely, frequently placing themselves in positions where sharing is difficult. 
So make a plan to live below your means and budget with generosity in mind so you can truly be ready to share. Now, what's the result of living this way? If having Christ is more than enough, if, if, if having more than enough is an opportunity to share, then what results should we expect? What results should we expect? Well, frankly, it's having the good life. It's having the good life. Look, look back at verse 19 here. Thus, storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is what? Truly life. Paul paints a picture in this verse of the good life. He uses the word treasure, which is a Greek word for a more intense version of the word for riches we've been reading. And he's laying out for us the opportunity to embrace this truth of having Christ as being good enough and following this practice of having enough means that there's more than enough opportunities to share. And it results in a good foundation, not a shaky foundation of consumerism or wealth, but instead a good foundation for having a truly good life. This means that this verse holds out a different and yet even more appealing promise than what our deception, even on its best day, has to offer. Having enough that makes you good enough can never offer you the truly good life that we crave. The best it can offer you, the best, is a cheap, momentary substitute that only looks good when eternity is not in view. The problem, as Jared Wilson pens it for us, though, is we are afraid there are no good things to come, or at least no good things comparable to the good things that can be had in this world. But the exact opposite is true. The good pleasures of this world are only signposts to the greater bliss of heaven. They cannot really compare to them, and therefore, we must never replace them. Friends, Paul's charge here offers the pursuit of the truly good life to come. Don't fall for the knockoff substitute that this world promises. Rather, fill your mind with thoughts of eternity because as Jesus said, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You know, personally, um, I remember when some of these things started to come home for me as an adult with a family. I remember I was driving home, and of all things, I was listening to a radio broadcast about how people in other countries uh, save their money, and that people in other countries far uh, poorer than, than, than where I was living were able to save 10% or 8% or 12% of their money monthly. And, and it started me thinking about how much I had and yet how much I saved by comparison. And in thinking about doing that, I began to realize, you know, just how truly wealthy I was, even as a brand new college student, working graduate, I did graduate, uh, a small church, and I was living in, in government rent-controlled apartments. <laughs> I began to realize that I'm wealthy. That this wasn't being wealthy by perhaps comparison, but instead by looking at what God had given me and how he had provided for my needs and then some. And let me tell you, that was a game changer for me. That was a game changer for me because in reality, I was wealthier than I was giving myself credit for. And don't miss this. And so I wasn't considering, I was limiting what God might have me do. And so I stopped. I stopped trying to focus so much on what God hadn't given me, what I couldn't give, what I couldn't do, and instead starting to look at his provision as to what has he given me, what time, what talent, what treasure do I have to offer? Not what I shouldn't, but what do I have to offer? I started considering beyond my tithe or some uh, occasional gift, you know, how else might God use me and what he had entrusted to me that was my responsibility. 
you know, thinking like this, again, it's been a game changer in empowering me to look for how I can be generous with the wealth that God has entrusted to me. And part of what excites me about thinking this way is embracing the promise of the good life that's laced in these verses. Embracing this promise. When I consider eternity, and I consider the true longings of my heart, when I consider the opportunity to take hold of that which is truly life, it motivates me. I want to have true treasure over merely worldly wealth. I want to build a good foundation because eternity is here in a blink of an eye. It will be here before we know it. As John Piper has said, life is too short, too precious, too painful to waste on worldly bubbles that burst. Heaven is too great, hell is too horrible, eternity is too long that we should putter around on the porch of eternity. So friends, let's not deceive ourselves and let's not put off our responsibility, but let's embrace the truth that having Christ is good enough and to follow the practice that having more than enough is an opportunity to share. And let's look forward in expectation to having the truly good life to come. Amen? Will you pray with me? Lord, some of us in this room are recognizing that we have spent a lot of our life puttering on the porch, investing and dreaming and believing only in worldly bubbles. God, some of us have spent our whole life consumed with the desire for more that has never been solved, never been reached. Like the prodigal son, God, we have run far from you pursuing the pleasures of this world. God, I pray that this morning we would sense the opportunity that's available to us to come home, to repent, to turn away, and to remember that we have a heavenly Father who always stands with his arms open wide, ready to forgive, ready to set us on a better direction of truly good life. And God, if we're sensing that invitation this morning to come home, God, I pray that we would embrace it, we would repent, that we would call out to you to be our heavenly Father, to turn our life over to you, and to live this life in a new direction under your authority, in your way, and pursuing the truly good life that is to come. Lord, we want to surrender these things to you and invite you to do the work that only you can do. We pray this in your matchless name. Amen.